Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our webinar titled Transitioning to the New Digital Apprenticeship Standard. We thank you for joining us. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to explain a few things about our webinar platform to allow you to get the most out of your experience. All viewers will be in listen-only mode. However, to engage with the webinar, please use the on-screen panels. Using the tabs of this panel, you can adjust your audio settings and choose the webcam of our presenters if available. You can also use the question tab to engage with us. We expect that our webinar will be extremely popular, but our team will do our best to answer your questions and queries. During our webinar, we'll be running a number of polls. To record your response, please click on the on-screen voting button when asked to do so. After the webinar, we'll be providing a recording of the webinar, a copy of the slides, and a fact sheet to address any unanswered questions. So I'd like to hand over to our presenter, David Wackett, who will also be joined by Claire Seager and Ken Gaines, who will be joining us remotely. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon to this uh, webinar on transitioning to the new digital industries apprenticeship standards. My name is David Wackett. I'm the industry manager for IT and digital, so I look after our IT and digital products, qualifications, and um, assessment products for the new uh, digital standards. Okay. Okay, what we're going to look at in the next half an hour or so, um, a brief overview of the, the current reforms, a look at what you need to consider when planning your transition, a brief overview of the current apprenticeship standards for which City and Guilds currently has assessment products, points to consider when planning your delivery, how we can support you to prepare for delivery and endpoint assessments, what services City and Guilds is able to offer throughout or whatever stage you are um, in your planning, the next steps that you need to take, and finally a brief question and answer session. Okay, so you may well be aware of some of the detail and the background to the current reforms. Um, obviously apprenticeships are changing. Many of you, especially if you're employers, may already be part of uh, that process, whether it's for digital or for other industry sectors within the uh, apprenticeship market. The most obvious difference between the, the current uh, frameworks and the new standards is that they are all employer-led. There are employer groups that have designed and developed these standards. They haven't been developed by city and guilds or other awarding bodies, they haven't been developed by the government, and they haven't been developed by sector skills councils. They've all been developed by employers. So employers are very much in the driving seat. And this is part of the, the government's uh, objective, is to get employers um, involved in designing apprenticeships that they want. Another feature that is, is probably fairly, fairly clear in, in any of the standards that you've, you may have looked at is the absence or the, the, the lower profile of uh, qualifications where they exist uh, within standards. The old SAFE frameworks, they pretty much it consisted of the, uh, the qualifications. That's not the case anymore, and that's a very deliberate part of the government's policy when they've designed the overall framework or the, the look and feel of, of these standards, um, it, is that it gives employers true control and flexibility over what goes on in the delivery of the apprenticeships. Before, it was the qualifications that dictated pretty much what was delivered, with the removal of the, the, the lower, uh, the, the less space the qualifications take in the new standards, um, it, it's, it's less important and it's much more important um, at what employers actually want um, delivered within uh, the, the standards themselves. Funding has been simplified, um, so we'll have an example, look at an example of that uh, shortly. And lastly, the overall purpose or objective of the new reforms is that it's the training that becomes effective. It's not about um, the assessment of qualifications. It's what goes on training individual apprentices uh, to make sure that they are sufficiently uh, prepared for the jobs that they're going to be taking. OK, so we have our first poll question here. You should see that on your screens now. So the question is, to what extent does your organisation understand the changes to apprenticeship funding? and delivery arrangements. So if you could place your answers, we have low level to little understanding, medium levels, high levels, or need help. You 
Because it looks like it's split between medium levels and high levels. Okay, thank you. Um, so here we have an example of uh, to show the highlights some of the key differences between uh, the SACE frameworks and the new standards. Obviously, as you can see quite clearly, there's a significant difference um, and a much more attractive at first glance uh, funding arrangement for the, for the new standards as opposed to the, the, the old frameworks. Secondly, the frameworks themselves, there was only one available at level three, another available at level four. What you're seeing now is standards that are designed for very specific job roles. So if we return to the actual funding itself, uh, that a level for the two level four standards there, software develop, developer and network engineer, maximum funding is currently £18,000. That's band 12 um, on the current funding um, arrangement. That's significantly higher than the old uh, or the, the, the current frameworks with a maximum funding of £12,000. Even if you take into account the incentives, which is about another five and a half, maximum five and a half thousand pounds, um, as opposed to another £2,000 for the standards, there's still a relatively attractive uh, funding uh, proposition there attached to the standards as opposed to the, the, the frameworks. So there's an incentive there straight away to start looking at and thinking about at least, if not planning, to deliver standards as opposed to the, uh, the frameworks. Okay. So why, why is it important to consider and start planning, at least thinking about what it is that you need to do? Well, the reforms, as we've already seen, they're happening now. This isn't something that's, that's going to happen in, in, a, in a year or a couple of years' time. It's something that's happening now. As, as we speak. Um, the current frameworks, whilst they're still available um, and funding is still there, that is not going to last. So people do need to start thinking about what they're going to be delivering in the near future. We're also aware that there's, there's varying degrees of confusion and, and possibly lack of information out there. There certainly hasn't been the degree of a, of a uh, public consultation or government-led uh, pub publicity around the new uh, apprenticeship standards as there has been in the past. It's very much a case of you can get involved if you want to, if you can find out about how to get involved on uh, employer groups um, uh, or get involved in terms of finding out um, the information's out there, it's out there on government websites, but there hasn't been a, a significant campaign to inform people. So we're hoping that through this presentation, um, other support, guidance, events that City and Guilds is putting on, that you will be better prepared and you'll have an understanding about what you need to do in the near future. So for those of you who have um, a relatively low um, degree of understanding about the new reforms, um, that's not necessarily something to be concerned about because there's plenty of support that City and Guilds is um, able to offer you. Okay. So some of the decisions that you will need to start thinking about. Uh, stay with the SAFE frameworks, as I said, funding is still available, but the, the significant disadvantage there is that the, the relatively um, inferior amount of funding that there is available. You may choose to stay with the SAFE frameworks for now and plan um, in the short term transitioning to the new standards. Obviously that still remains um, the financial difficulty of not changing to standards straight away. Um, obviously, if you do change the standards straight away, then you're going to benefit from the uh, advantageous funding that's available. Or you may choose to take your time and think about what you're going to do in the longer term. And obviously, you're going to lose income from not um, having any provision at all. Okay. A brief overview then of what's the, the key differences. With the old Frameworks, the, the key difference, as I've mentioned before, are the qualifications and the, the part that the qualifications play um, in terms of delivery and assessment of the, the old frameworks. Those qualifications pretty much were the old uh, SAFE frameworks, um, whereas now there, are, there is a lack of qualifications or the qualifications take up a smaller part 
of the new standards. Maths and English remains a feature, so that's either GCSE or functional skills, uh, maths and English, if that hasn't really been achieved by the apprenticeship. Uh, with the new standards, they must be achieved before the gateway is achieved um, prior to the endpoint assessment. Qualifications can be part of the on program. In, in the case of the digital, there, depending on which standard you're looking at, there are a number of sitting guilds knowledge qualifications or knowledge modules, or alternatively, there are the um, professional qualifications, vendor, uh, vendor certifications, depend, again, depending that the mix will depend on the, the actual standard that you're looking at. Uh, as I said, maths and English uh, remains part of the, of the new standards. Um, and there is a new element that's being assessed, which is the behaviours, which are part of the, the standards. The endpoint assessment is something that occurs towards the end of this apprenticeship programme or after the delivery of all the, the learning and, and, and so forth. So that's a new feature. It, you liken, liken it to taking your GCSEs and A-levels. Whilst it's not an exam, it's something that happens at the end rather than continuously as with um, MBQs and so forth with the current, um, current frameworks. There's still the certification. Upon completion, get an um, apprenticeship certificate from City and Guilds and from um, the, the funding agency as well. And then you're deemed, the apprentice is deemed occupationally competent. As I said before, there's, there's guidance available, there's guidance for employers, there's guidance for um, providers. Um, those uh, images there, there are, they are links directly to the City and Guilds website and there's some further information and guidance um, available later on in this presentation um, which I can direct you to. So who's behind the new standards? As I said before, they are employer-led. So these are some of the employers who've been involved in the design of the current standards. So as I said before, they're, they're not led by, um, they're not been designed by city and guilds. They're very much um, in the hands of employers. So some of those people you'd expect to see there, IBM, Cisco, Microsoft, plus there's people from the world of retail, retail banking, uh, John Lewis and, and Lloyds, um, BCS, British Com uh, Computer Society, and also city and guilds have been advised uh, uh, involved in an advisory capacity um, at, as well. Um, you can see those standards, there is a link at the bottom of that particular slide where you can go directly to see all of the digital standards, um, all alternatively you can just Google um, digital apprenticeship standards and that will take you there uh, as well. So in your, after this presentation in your own time you can explore all of those standards as well as the assessment plans as they are have been pu uh, published. Okay, so a little bit more detail about what the new digital standards uh, comprise of. There's a clear distinction there between the on-program elements and the endpoint assessment. So that thick black line is something that um, effectively is the um, gateway to the endpoint assessment, and that gateway must be a, a point where the uh, apprentice provider and the employer agree that that apprentice is ready and able to take the endpoint assessment. Prior to that, the employer must ensure that the work that the apprentice is doing is sufficiently um, stretching to make sure that the apprentice is developed um, and they're fully engaged in their work role um, in order to gather the evidence for, for example, the summative portfolio and they're able to um, complete other elements of the endpoint assessment um, sufficiently well. Also part of the on-program assessment are the vendor or professional qualifications or the sitting guilds knowledge modules or a mixture of the two depending on the particular standard. As I said that thick black line is the, the gateway and that must be at the point where the uh, provider and the employer agree that the apprentice is ready. It's not a fixed point in time, there's not a timetable of exams that happen every May or June and that's when the uh, endpoint assessment is taken. It can be taken at any point after 12 months of learning on the program. It must be a minimum of 12 months, it can be longer, but the point is you must ensure that the apprentice is ready. 
The feature of all of the digital uh, standards is, is the same in terms of the, the components of the endpoint assessment. So there's a summative portfolio, which is, is different from your typical NVQ portfolio. So it's evidence that highlights the, the very best of what the apprentice has achieved and demonstrated typically towards the end of that 12-month learning program. So it's not going to be evidence that's been gathered within the first few days or first few, few weeks even. A synoptic project, with, which is a contextualized piece of work. Um, employers, providers can choose which is the most appropriate um, from those that are available for the, for the particular situation that their apprentices are working in. So it's a, it's a simulated activity based on the typical work that they'll be doing. There's also an employer reference that must be provided, and finally, an interview. All of that is conducted by the Endpoint Assessment Organization. It's not conducted by assessors um, on program. That's not to say that assessors don't have a role to play. So your typical assessors who may be involved in MVQ type delivery, their role is very much about supporting on program, formatively assessing um, apprentices. So they do have a very important role in terms of preparing uh, apprentices for the endpoint assessment as, and ensuring that they are um, ready and that their learning um, is, is sufficient. So they don't have a part to play in the endpoint assessment itself. That's conducted by an organization such as City and Guilds, um, but they are, are, are still very important. So do bear in mind that uh, whilst roles may have changed um, compared to frameworks, um, you know, staff and personnel do have a critical role to play in, in the new world. Okay, thank you. So what do we have available at the moment? So Sitting Guilds currently provides a full assessment and on-program um, package for network engineer, software developer, infrastructure technician, and digital marketer. So that includes the knowledge qualifications where they're available. Um, and the vendor certificates, as well as the endpoint assessment itself. And also guidance, significant is guidance about how to prepare your um, apprentices for the endpoint assessment. We are also looking at, in particular, the top three there, technical sales, IT technical sales um, standard, unified communication specialist, and cybersecurity technologist. So those that are, we aspire to providing, and there's some others down there, software development technician, software tester, business data analyst, cyber intrusion technologist, uh, which we're also considering as, as well. Okay, so we have the next poll for you. So you should see it coming up on your screens now. So the question is, which of the following apprenticeship standards will you be offering? So we have software developer, network engineer, infrastructure technician, and digital marketer. If you don't see one where that you're delivering, don't worry, we've put this poll into two parts, so it might be in the next one, but I'll leave some of you to vote. Okay, so with this result, it looks like the majority of you are delivering digital marketer. Okay, now for the second part, it's the same question. Which of the following apprenticeship standards will you be offering? And we have cybersecurity technologist, IT technical sales, software test start, business slash data analyst. And with this, it looks like half of you are business slash data analyst. Okay. So we're just trying to get the PowerPoint back.
Verb of the second. Are going to be having technical problems? Okay, we've got it back. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, um, very briefly then, what sitting guilds currently have, um, just to confirm what we, we have available in terms of our endpoint assessment and on-program qualification offer, infrastructure technician, network engineer, software developer, and digital marketer. Uh, the knowledge qualifications are available um, now. Um, the tests are available now for learners to, to be registered on. EPA guidance is available now, as well as the, the, the synoptic projects um, are available to be taken now. Digital market is slightly behind that, so they're, so they're currently still under development, but for the other three standards, um, all of those components um, are available now. So the dates are up there with regard to the digital market as to when those things will be available. So we're, we're developing new synoptic projects. That's a key thing because we need to have um, sufficient projects available that meet the needs of individual um, apprentices and, and employers in terms of the, the working situations that they are in. So those are being developed. We have um, project briefs which give an indication of um, a, a brief description basically of, of the scenario or the situation um, as appropriate for those particular job roles. Uh, one thing to add, uh, successful apprentices may apply to join the register of IT technicians, so there is some additional professional recognition upon achieving the apprenticeships uh, in addition. That's um, a, a, an additional cost, that's, that's not a city and guilds thing, that's an independent organisation, but they're recognising um, that apprentices are able to join, they're sufficiently um, capable and, and qualified to join their organisation. Okay, so in terms of vendor or professional body certification, for network engineer and software developer, um, there is only um, one vendor qualification that is um, required, and that may vary depending on the version of the standard um, that is, is being taken. For infrastructure technician, there's a mixture of either vendor or knowledge modules, so you can choose as many um, of, of, of either vendor or the knowledge modules um, to satisfy the, the knowledge components of the standards. Technical sales, currently there are no mod, not, not knowledge modules or not the knowledge qualifications available at all. Sitting Guilds is looking at alternative ways of um, certificating that knowledge component through things such as digital badging. Okay. Some issues around the, the vendor or professional body certification, that funding, there's no funding at all for basically additional knowledge modules that are taken outside of the minimum required within the standards. So if, if an employer wants to do additional knowledge or their apprentices to take additional um, examinations for the professional vendor certification, that funding is not available. The funding is available for the learning it's just examination fees cannot be paid for out of the um, apprenticeship funding pot. So that would have to be paid for as an additional cost. But any costs associated with delivering the learning can be paid for out of the apprenticeship funding. Okay, in particular relating to the software developer standard, um, ncp.net, Oracle SQL, all of those exams must be taken. Okay, that's that's not correct. It's only those exams that are relevant to the the learner, the apprentice, um, and what the employer wants them to take. So they could take all of the exams, or they can just take those that are relevant to their particular job role. 
learners can only do the exam state. So the, the standards list the exams um, that are required. Obviously, over a period of time, they're going to be replaced, um, which would mean that you would take an out, out of date um, qualification or that out of date exam. Okay, that's not true either. So wherever there is a replacement examination or a more up-to-date version, it's the more up-to-date or relevant version that should be taken. Okay, so those are what briefly what the standards look like. There's the digital marketer standard. So we've got, I've, I've briefly summarized those. I haven't got space to put everything down there on one slide. So they include skills and knowledge, which I'm sure everybody is familiar with. What is new? with the new standards is are the behaviors on the right hand side. Um, one thing that is missing from uh, the new standards as opposed to uh, the old frameworks are things such as uh, personal learning and thinking skills and employment rights and responsibilities. I suppose the behaviors really address that and these are um, ensure that the, the apprentice doesn't just have the technical knowledge, skills and capabilities but they're actually ready to fulfill their work role in a genuine working environment so they can work with other people and they can they've got a bit, a bit of get up and go they can work under their own initiative so the behaviors ensure that the apprentice is um, able to fully meet the requirements of, of an employer once they progress into a, um, a, a full-time job role grading Another new feature of standards is that they are graded. Um, the digital standards are all graded pass, merit, or distinction. The grading criteria are those three things at the top there, the, the what, the how, and the with whom. So what the apprentice has done to show that they can do the job. The way in which the work has been done and the with whom. The personal and interpersonal qualities that they've brought to their work relationships. So in order to get a distinction, they must fulfill the basic criteria for each of those, or the basic level for each of those criteria, um, over and above um, what is required for a pass. To get a merit, they must achieve um, a significant level of quality above the basic required for the what, and either the how and the with whom. So in effect, you're probably going to have uh, apprentices who will either get a pass or a distinction is if they're getting two of those those grades at sig significantly above the basic level, then they're, they're pretty much going to get all three. So not all apprenticeship standards are graded past merit and distinction, but the, the digital ones are. Um, but we envisage that most learners are going to get either a pass or a distinction. Um, there's no individual component that can be failed. The grading is a, hol a holistic um, process the independent assessor once they've conducted the interview which really pulls together all of the previous or other elements of the endpoint assessment the synoptic project the portfolio and the, the employer reference and it's at that point that the uh, assessor will make their their grading uh, judgment okay so what do you need to consider uh, what is the apprenticeship so which of those particular standards are you interested in delivering what do they do they meet the, the needs of your organization in terms of the roles that you're employing people um, to, to do? How do you go about registering learners on the apprenticeship? What are your timelines? Um, how will you meet them? What support materials um, have you already got so you can use your existing resources or do you need new materials? Um, staff, do your staff need additional training or upskilling? What do you need to know about the endpoint assessment and booking it? Um, and the relationship that you have with um, your endpoint assessment organisation will be key as well. Okay, so we've got another poll. You can see that on your screens now. So the question is, what do you consider to be the greatest challenge to your own staff when delivering apprenticeships? So we have putting systems and processes in place, having the right expertise in-house to to deliver apprenticeships, understanding funding rules and regulations and what to spend the levy on, or establishing the on-program delivery and assessment material. I'll give you some more time to put your challenges in.
So it looks like the majority of you find building the on-program delivery and assessment materials to be the most challenging task. Okay, so uh, moving swiftly on, because uh, we're nearly nearly running out of time, there's a little bit to, to get through. Uh, this is what sitting guilds um, can provide. So there are qualification handbooks available for all the on-program knowledge modules and knowledge qualifications. There are endpoint assessment packs available once you register with us. Uh, project briefs to outline what it is that apprentices will be taking as part of their synoptic project. Employ and provide a guidance, we've seen that already. We also have learning assistant, our e-portfolio, which will support the on-program delivery of the standards. We have accreditation and credentialing service, so if you believe that your uh, provision and your delivery is worthy of additional certification from City and Guilds, you can apply, you can come to us, and we can rubber stamp that, um, particularly for those uh, standards where there's, there's fewer qualifications basically you might feel that that's an additional um, added value. There are regional events, we'll come on to that and give you some dates um, a little while shortly. Um, additional webinars and you also have, a, we have a dedicated advisor um, in Ken Gaines who's got many years of experience out there both in delivering qualifications and working in um, the IT and digital industries itself. Okay, the endpoint assessment pack is probably key in terms of preparing your learners. As I said, this will be available <clears throat> to centres once you register. It's password protected. It's on the website, and you'll be able to get um, that password once you register. So it gives you, um, obviously, the guidance, uh, the standard, rather, guidance on how to book the EPA, and in particular, guidance on how the summative portfolio works. So how that's going to work, how you're going to support your apprentices through that process, and similarly, um, support and guidance on um, the, summit, the synoptic project and the interview, how they work and the processes involved and how you can prepare your apprentices for them. <clears throat> Currently all of the apprenticeship packages are priced at £1,200. That's an initial £200 registration fee so that we know that you exist and know that you intend to um, take your apprentices through the process with us and then there's an additional £1,000 uh, booking fee for the endpoint assessment, um, and that takes place 90 days before they actually uh, sit the endpoint assessment. Resets are a thousand pounds. There's no single component of the endpoint assessment that can be failed. So, because it's holistically um, assessed and, and graded, then um, the whole thing would have to be not necessarily every single part have to be completed again. It depends on where there's, there's areas of weakness. Um, there is no VAT, and we don't charge VAT, so those prices are, are what you will pay. <clears throat> approval process for those centres who aren't already sitting guild centres, you will need to gain approval to be a sitting guild centre. If you're already develop, uh, delivering our qualifications and apprentices, apprenticeships, you will still need to gain approval to offer these digital uh, apprenticeship packages. As I said, the assessment pack will be available once you have registered with us, um, and you do need to ensure that your staff are sufficiently um, expert and can demonstrate that in order to get um, approval. Brief um, overview of the, the, the process for booking and the endpoint assessment itself. Uh, once learners are registered on the program, there's that £200 registration fee. There's a £1,000 booking reservation fee, which is uh, 90 days uh, prior to the actual EPA happening. The date for that EPA is agreed between the provider and the employer, ensuring that the, um, the apprentice is ready. And then an ESFA data capture form is issued for the provider or the employer to complete. Okay. Yeah. Okay. In addition to your role as um, providers and, and employers, there's also an opportunity for you and your staff to actually get involved in the endpoint um, assessment itself. 
Um, so you can be independent assessors and you can work for sitting guilds in that capacity. Um, so that's something that you might well want to consider. There's information and there's application procedures on the website if you uh, follow that link there. We're not requiring that assessors have assessor qualifications. Um, it's, it's desirable, but it's more important that you have um, uh, industry occupational expertise and, and, and knowledge and have been working in that particular field. What's coming up? Um, well, it, it, this month already you can register for Digital Marketer alongside the other standards, um, register for the uh, qualifications, uh, which are administered through our online Evolve system. There are events, there's face-to-face -face events through our st strategic advisory group in Wakefield, that's next week on the 15th, in Taunton on the 26th of this month, um, in July in Manchester on the 13th, and then one later in the year in London on the 11th of October. Okay, so next steps. At whatever stage of um, readiness you are at, Sitting Guilds is, is available to um, advise, come in in some instances and examine your current provision and give you some detailed advice in terms of how to prepare um, for next steps and whether you need to upskill your, your team um, and look at your existing provision and see what, um, what you need to do to, to be in a place to effective, effectively de deliver the next generation of uh, uh, apprenticeships through the standards. Lots of information and support there. At the top, you've got uh, some links to what we've got on our website. So some general advice and guidance about apprenticeships in general. Um, below that, you've got some government websites. So it's always useful to see what's current and what's out there in terms of the, um, the, the government agenda, in terms of what uh, new standards are around the corner, and guidance on funding, um, a lot of these things are constantly changing or being tweaked and fine-tuned. Um, so funding is a key thing that I'm sure you will want to um, keep up to date with. Okay, and lastly, thank you for, for listening. Um, if you want to keep in touch, you can keep in touch through our email updates um, by registering on that address there. You can keep in touch through getting in touch with us directly through our email address there. I'll get in touch with direct sales if you want information on new standards, what resources, if you want any demonstrations, and if you want any additional information on the endpoint assessment process, uh, endpoint assessment team, they have a dedicated email address there, epa at sittingguilds.com. Okay, so now we have time for some questions. So if any of you listening in have any questions you want answered, please um, write on the question tab and we'll get around to answering them. So the first question we have here is, regarding maths and English, do we know if it must be GCSE slash functional skills or does SAIS still apply to standards? Um, well, SAIS, I think SAIS was a little bit more detailed in terms of what it exactly was required, but yes, it's GCSE or functional skills is, is, are required if they haven't already been achieved. Next question here is, is the price a one-off fee? Well, there's two components to it. There's initial £200 um, registration. That's to ensure that we know that, that you're out there and that you exist um, and so that we can prepare and we know how many uh, apprentices are coming down the line in the near future to take the endpoint assessment um, and then there's a later £1,000 fee. That covers everything. There's no additional fees. The qualifications, the on-program qualifications are included within all of that total uh, £1,200. Okay. The, the, the only additional part that you would have to pay is if uh, anybody had to reset one of the knowledge qualifications or they have to reset the endpoint assessment. Um, but David's absolutely right. Everything else is completely included. Yes, yeah, sorry. So that would be an addition. I think it's fifteen pounds to retake um, one of the knowledge yeah. modules. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that does lead on to a next question. It says, "Are the reset fees on an individual basis?" An individual apprentice. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
next question we have is when will the digital marketer standards be ready? Um, well, in terms of the standards are, are ready, they've been published. In terms of our offer, um, that should be available very, very soon. My understanding is that um, it should be up there and available on Wall Garden on the catalogue um, within a matter of uh, the next couple of weeks at the very most. Um, but information, other information about Digital Marketer should be up on the website um, shortly too. But in terms of the standards and the assessment plan itself, you can see those on the on the government website, the gov.uk website. In terms of our actual offer, then um, that should be available very, very shortly. So you should be able to start registering learners through the wall garden um, soon. Okay, so someone's been here. Go on, Ken. I was just going to say the, um, the the knowledge stuff has all been written. The tests have all been written. Um, we're just waiting, uh, as David says, to get it up on the wall garden to allow people to register. Um, what we're also doing is we're looking for um, key employers and providers who who work in the digital marketing space to help shape the synoptic projects because we want to make sure that we give the right range for the different types. Uh, of the digital marketing activities are out there. So if you are interested, not just in being an independent assessor, but actually helping um, scope or review or even help write some of those synoptic <coughs> briefs, then please contact uh, contact us um, because you know we want as many people involved as possible. So we make sure this is right for you. Okay. Thank you. Great. Someone just wants clarification here. So they said, just to clarify, your price is twelve hundred per learner. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, another question: Are there plans for smart screen resources? Um, it's it's mm -hmm. tough to give. It's tough to do uh, resources for some of this stuff. Basically, because uh, as David showed right at the beginning of the presentation. The whole point of the standards is they're designed to allow the employer to develop the learner in in a way for the job role within that employer. Um, we are potentially looking at some generic uh, materials maybe for the knowledge, but the practical stuff will be very tough because it will vary from employer to employer exactly how, how they want. And uh, as you've seen, because we're now going to individual job roles away from that single apprenticeship uh, framework where you know there was lots of things that you could do with that, then people are picking uh, a standard that is closest to what their apprentice uh, may be doing. So you know it, it's quite tough to produce some of this stuff. But if people have suggestions of areas where they would feel uh, some generic help may be useful, then of course we can look at doing that. Okay. Again, in regards to resources, will there be a mapping document released for recording the behaviours? Sorry, could you um, It says, again, in regards to resources, will there be a mapping document released for recording the behaviours? Um, no. Um, go, sorry, Ken. I was just going to say, um, in terms of the behaviours, if, uh, if when people look at the endpoint assessment guidance uh, mm. handbooks, you'll find exactly what we're looking for in terms of evidence uh, to go into that summative portfolio to show that the behaviours are are met. And the behaviours have been outlined in the occupational briefs for the various standards as well. So it is quite quite clear what is being expected and what needs to be shown. And, and it will be things coming from appraisals, it will be things coming from emails, from mentoring sessions that the mm. providers are doing or the managers are doing with the apprentice. So mm. not quite sure what, what is meant by mapping, but we, we are getting yeah. clear guidance of what we expect. I, I think when we produce um, a, doc, like a recording document, it becomes kind of quite rigid. Um, and it becomes like, well, this is the only thing that can be used and the only form of evidence. So I, I understand that, especially when something's new, people will want some additional guidance to ensure, you know, quite rightly that they're covering the right things. But 
very often we find when we do provide record documents, when we record recording documents and so forth, that it becomes a little bit restrictive. Uh, whereas the whole purpose of, um, especially the, um, the 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 synoptic um, portfolio, um, the summative portfolio rather, um, that evidence can come from a whole range of different sources. And, and if we provided a, a recording document, I think it would be quite limiting. And as Ken said, the guidance is there in the EPA pack um, to, to provide sufficient information yeah. about how to actually re record that. So I, I do understand that you know, people will want as much support and guidance as possible, especially when something's new. But um, yeah, sometimes that can be, it could potentially be a bit of a hindrance and, and limit um, what it is that you're able to gather. Okay. Yeah, it could it, it could have totally the opposite effect that, that has been desired by the standards. Yeah. Okay, we seem to have run out of time, um, but if anyone else listening in has any more questions, could you please quickly type it into your question tab, and we will follow up um, with a written document with all our answers. So I'll give you a minute or so just to write down any questions that you have and send them into us through the question tab now. Um, but we seem to have run out of time, unfortunately. Um, but we are still running the series of occupational um, webinars. So please um, look at our website for all the upcoming webinars. Um, it's a busy month for us, so please do register. Um, but thank you, David, Ken, and Claire for joining us today. And we will send out a follow-up email with all the slides, questions, and a recording. Thank you. Thank you.